So good morning everyone. Good morning. Today is um Sabbath June sixth, two thousand and twenty. And yes, we are already in June. Uh and so I hope so far everyone had a uh, a great um first semester of this year. Uh even though we had a lot of uh, negativity going on but still today is the Sabbath of the Lord and uh, I hope that we are enjoying that day uh, to the fullest of it and so as we start today we're going to look at the we're going to continue with the message of the sanctuary and we looked at the outer court and we looked at the first furniture of the of the first compartment. And in the outer court we looked at the altar of sacrifice, the bronze liver, and and then when we went to when we went to the first compartment, which is the holy place, we looked at the table for shoe bread. And today we are going to see uh, to go to the next uh, furniture, which is the seven the golden candlesticks or the seven branch candlesticks now uh so today is of course today is the golden candlesticks and i wanted to mention it to show you that the picture again of the the the, the layout of the sanctuary here we have uh as you can see the gate we have the altar of offering or altar of sacrifice, and then we have the laver, and which all of these were covered in silver, or oh, bronze, red, and everything inside of the the tabernacle is covered in gold. Now, we saw that the altar of sacrifice represent uh, represented the the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It also represents um, repentance and sorrow for sin. And we see that the labor represents baptism by water and Holy Spirit. And the table for Shabbat represented the word of God that we have to study. We have to eat uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Uh, and and now we're going to look at the seven branch candlestick. And I would like to mention that the... The candlesticks, the showbread, and the altar of incense, as you're looking at right now on the screen, on the holy place, those work together. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that last time, but they work together. Um, you cannot have one without the other. And so if you're studying God's word, you have to pray, which is, you have to pray to get enlightened. And once you've studied, then it's time to go and share it to other people. And today we're going to look at the golden candlesticks and see what it actually means. Um, so here is the picture of the sanctuary. I'm not sure if you can see it properly, but you can see uh, you can see the that's the, the the inner veil. You can see the table for sugar on the far right. You can see the candlesticks on the far left, and you can see the the out of incense in the front and then right behind the second veil is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, let me start by saying that in the book of Exodus chapter 27 verse 20, God says to Moses, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you, they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light. To cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall attend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. And now, so what we just read, what we just read here was that, um, was that that God made a, a covenant 
God made a covenant um, with the uh, Israelites, and they were supposed to they were supposed to um, keep the the lamp burning. Well, the lamp burning signifies something, and as we move along, I'm gonna bring it back to what the what the lamp burning actually means. Um, hopefully, if I remember. Because I, I want to mention it when it's uh, at the appropriate time. Right now, I don't think it is because we have to look at other things. Uh, and I think this one is going to be a bit shorter than before, so bear with me. Also, in the book of Exodus chapter 19, uh, verse 3 to verse 6, and the Bible says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Mount Sinai, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I had did, what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on, on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So what that means is, whenever God makes a covenant with a with a person or a group of people, then you can un- you can surely know that you should be a set aside people. You know, um, peculiar means somebody who is different and most Christians today have a uh, have a uh, have vilified they have vilified the idea of being peculiar and and every time you start to bring um, the Bible standard a lot of the Christians are very belligerent and they want to stop their ears but they want they are so belligerent that it is hard to have a conversation because they are following the fashions of the world and so uh, um, just to mention as well i'm gonna start a youtube uh, live video hopefully monday wednesday and friday uh from 6 to 6 30 maybe 6 30 to 7 where i'm gonna talk about i'm gonna be reading from a book called uh, foundation foundation of, of education and where it talks about how we should raise not basically the the raising of children and uh, how we should dress as Christians and speak and things like that but I'm gonna call it the Christian way meaning the true Christian Christian way and so stay up for that um, more likely Monday Wednesday and Friday from 6 30 to 7 i'm gonna start this monday uh june 8th 2020 and so and by god's grace we're gonna look at the whole book and see what we can learn from that book and so to be a covenant to have a covenant with god means you have to be different you have to go with how god says we should be and kingdom of priests and a holy nation a holy person is a person set apart. It's a person sanctified. That's why the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 that God, verse 1 to verse 3, and after God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says, and he rested on the seventh day and hallowed it and sanctified it. Basically made it holy, made it set apart. And so we need to be also set apart people for God. And now, First Peter chapter two, verse one to verse six says, "Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking." Now, if you remember, in the book of First um, Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen says, uh, "If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything is made new." And so, when if you are made new in Christ. If you be, if you just if you if you choose to get to get to start that covenant with Christ to be a holy person uh, a kingdom of priests unto God, 
then you will have to lay aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, all envies and evil speaking. Now of course it's not going to be easy because Satan is going to attack you even triple. You know, he is very belligerent towards anyone who wants to keep God. And so, and of course, he's also called the accuser of our brethren in the book of, in chapter 12 of Revelation verse 11, which means he will vilify you uh, before the whole world. But of course, God has the ultimate answer at the end. Now, in all evil speaking, so we need to lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. Uh, why? Because we are... Because we want to be uh, a candlestick, you know, we, we want to be part of that candlestick, part of that covenant to be with God. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tested that the Lord is gracious, to whom come in, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And how do you offer up spiritual sacrifices? Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says what? In being, I'm going to have to paraphrase, paraphrase it. Uh, it basically talks about we need to, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Actually, you know what? Let me get my Bible first. And let me just read it for you. Um, Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. And, uh, and it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And this is the spiritual sacrifices that we have to do, is to present ourselves as our bodies as holy sacrifices, not to kill ourselves, but to live according to the precepts that God has put in his word. Six, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. And you know, Whenever the, the Catholics were talking about um, the Pope, that Peter was the first Pope because apparently, apparent, the Pope, because apparently Jesus studied, told him, your name is Peter, and on that rock, I will put my, I will put my, my, my church, something like that. And they say that, oh no, because Jesus, um, Jesus told Peter he is the rock, and so Peter was the first Pope of the Christian church. But in reality, Peter is saying that, Peter is talking about Jesus Christ, you know. Peter is talking about Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. So it's not Peter who's the who's the stone. It is Jesus. Actually, by the way, if you read in the book of Daniel chapter two, Daniel chapter two, Daniel says um, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of the statue, and at the end he saw a stone cut out without hand, and struck that statue in its foot. That's chapter two of Daniel, and the Bible says that. That stone represents God's kingdom, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. It's not Peter, so it is Jesus who is the cornerstone. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, which is Jesus, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. In verse 7, Unto you therefore which, is, which believe he is, pressures, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, or, or, or basically the chief cornerstone. And Peter here is talking about Jesus Christ, not himself, but of Jesus. And, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumbled at the word, being disobedient, were unto also they were repented. Verse 9. But ye, or let's put it that way, but I, but you, but we, even today, but we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should, that we should 
show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so when people say that God made a covenant with Israel and that we are not in that covenant, then they are also actually rejecting the New Testament, even though they call themselves New Testament Christians. Because it is for us as well. That covenant is made for us as well as old Israel. Verse 10, which in time past were, were not a peace, were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so, being a candlestick on this planet, on this earth, is a privilege for us. And now, why do I say that? Well, if we go back to the, to the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus chapter 24, verse number 1 to verse number 4 says this, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee, meaning unto Aaron, pure oil, or pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn continually. So, um, if the sanctuary message is about, excuse me, if the if the candlesticks in the sanctuary message is about making the lamp to burn continually, then if we are to be part of that covenant, then we have to become lamps that burn continually, right? That's what it would be. And so people say that, oh no, we can live, we can, they claim to follow God, but then they want to live like Satan and they want to have the name Christians without actually following the Christian way of living this life. Then we can know that they have no light in them. Why? Because Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 says this to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They don't have any candlestick. They don't have any lamp. They don't have any light in them. They don't have any pure olive oil. They are empty. They have darkness in themselves, yet they assume they have light. And so, verse 2, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure olive oil, pressed olive for the light, to make the lamp to burn continually. I would cite the word of the testimony in the tabernacle above of meeting. Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generation. He shall be in charge of the lamps and the pure gold lampstand, lampstand before the Lord continually. And interestingly, that he says, it shall be a statute forever in your generation. If you think about it, most people would assume that that thing ended with the Israelites. But in a sense, we are called Israelites as well. If you have for father Abraham, then you're going to be part of that Israelite covenant. Actually, Romans chapter 11 is talking about the Christians of today, the Gentiles of today, that the tree, which is Jesus Christ, which, which had the old branches, which is the old Israel of the Old Testament, because they did not believe, they were cut off from the tree, and those that believe from the earth, they, basically God took them and grafted them into the tree. And so, if we want to believe in God and live according to God, we will be grafted in on the tree as well. And we'll be part of that Israel that God is, is actually building. And in case you didn't know, the Bible, in the Bible, God only makes a covenant with Israel, nobody else. So, you're either going to be an Israelite by nature, meaning by birth, or you're going to be an Israelite by faith. Either way, you have to be an Israelite because God only makes a covenant with Israel. If that's not clear, you can put it on the comment and I can actually um, even study it more with you. Let's move on. Ha! Huh. Matthew chapter 5. Now, to those that claim to be new covenant or new testament believers new covenant believers because they say the old testament is the old covenant and the new testament is the new covenant in the new testament we are called to be what again a light to the world now 
you are the salt of the earth. Matthew, that, that's Matthew chapter 5 verse 13, verse, that's Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 verse 16. You are the, you, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is, therefore, it, it is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither can neither do men light a candle and put it on the bushel, but on a candlestick. Interestingly, Jesus used the term candlestick, you know? And where do we find that term candlestick in the Bible? Well, we find that term exactly in the sanctuary message. Isn't that right? In the sanctuary message, we find that term candlestick. The seven golden candlestick, and so is this, is Jesus referring to the sanctuary message? Yes. So why people are not studying this, the message of the sanctuary? I don't know. I don't know. And he giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Um, there is a, pre a prevalent, uh, a predominant uh, false teaching in today's Christianity, talking about um, all we need to do is believe and believe and have faith and believe and have faith and believe and have faith. But you never hear them talk about um, doing good works. Oh no, because that's legalism, in a sense. You know, when you when you say you have faith, there has to be uh, a work that follows, right? There has to be a work that follows, and that work that follows is that work that follows shows what your faith is. That's why James chapter two says this in I believe verse fourteen verse sixteen says. Uh, Actually, let, let me actually read it for you instead. Let me read it for you instead. Talking about faith and works, right? James chapter 2. Verse number 13. No? Verse number 14. Okay? What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man saith that he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Verse 15. If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, nevertheless, ye give them not these things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, if it hath, if, if, if it hath not works, is dead, being at all. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And so, can faith alone save you? No. Can work alone faith, faith, um, save you? No. You need both of them. You need faith and work because a faith that a work a faith that is put on to work is exactly what God is looking for. You say you believe in, in the Bible, then the work is live according to the Bible precepts and be a be a light to the world. Candlestick. Now let's talk about um oh no, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's talk about uh, something more interesting now. I'm gonna let me let me quickly uh, do this part right here. Let me quickly do that, and then uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Let me quickly talk about um, this part. 
if you know if you know who Martin Luther was, he used to be a Catholic monk, uh, and uh, he. We're talking about the light. He 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 mentioned this, and I, I find it very interesting what he mentioned in the book of We Controversy, chapter seven, page one twenty. He said, "Foremost among those who were in the, in in that book, in that book, it says foremost among those who were called to lead the church from darkness of popery into the light of the of a purer faith stood Martin Luther, zealous." ardent and devoted knowing no fear but the fear of god and what is the fear of god the fear of of the lord is the beginning of wisdom not just that that's proverbs 9 verse 10 but the fear of god in proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 is also to hate evil so knowing no fear but the fear of god and acknowledging no foundation for religious faith but the Holy Scriptures, Sola Scriptura. Luther was the man of his time. Through him, God accomplished a great work for the reformation of the Church and the enlightenment of the world. Now, what does that even mean? Well, what that what that means is, what that means is, whenever you want to become a, a, a candlestick <clears throat> whenever you want to become a candlestick or you want to become a light to the world God will use you but there are conditions if you have to be separated from your people to be that kind of light then you need to do that too I know it's, I know it's not easy and the last thing anyone would do is to leave their churches. If God tells me to leave my church to become a light to the world, to reform, then I will do that. Okay? But, ultimately, we have to live according to the Bible. Whether you were Catholics, whether you were um, Methodists, whether you were uh, Lutherans, whether you were Evangelicals, Anabaptists, um, Baptists, Presbyterian, uh, Anglicans, whatever you like to be, the one thing that is more important is not the name of the church you follow, but is that you're following the Bible principles. That's the most important. And as you follow Bible principles, you will become a light to those that are in darkness who are not following the Word of God. Let's move on. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 1 through verse 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Why? Because they were new converts. They were new converts. I have fed you with milk. If you're a baby, you drink milk. And not with meat. Meat meaning hard food, not like it's um, chicken or beef or goat or deer or gazelle or things like that. It just means harder food like um, rice and beans, bread, um, tomatoes and potatoes and things and plantain and sweet potatoes and yam. So basically, as a baby, you don't give baby yam, plantain. You give them milk because they're babies. They don't have teeth to chew yet. For hither though ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, because you're still babies. For you are yet carnal, meaning you you just got converted. You can you're not gonna be spiritual just like that. It's gonna take a process, which is called sanctification. And the part that we are studying right now is sanctification part. The candlestick, the table for sherbet, the altar of incense, which is the holy place, is a sanctification process. For yet for you are yet carnal. For where has where whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So remember we looked at in first Peter chapter two verse one, 
Therefore, leaving all malice, all guile, all envying and evil speaking and hypocrisies. Yes, those are the carnal passions of men. Well, people that are new converts, they are still carnal. They haven't learned in the school of Christ yet. They are still learning from the school of men. But now they have attended Christ's school, there, there is that leap between the Christ, world, Christ school and the world school. The Christ school Christ school and the and men school. Christ school and the men and as and as they keep learning from Christ, it's gonna be more Christ, 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 Christ. So now they are more likely men, men, men schools, men schools, men schools, and then Christ. And then men school, men school, Christ, Christ. And then men's and then Christ, 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 until they get to be Christ, 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 all the way. That's the work of sanctification. So right now they are still carnal, meaning they haven't learned deep enough to become spiritual and to be like-minded with Christ. And so Hebrews chapter 5. For when the time for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You are still babies. I mean, we need to give you the baby food. And to those of you watching this message of the sanctuary is the baby food to under to unlock in the Bible. It's the baby food because when we get to deeper things, if you don't have that foundation, you're not gonna understand the deeper aspect of the Bible. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe or infant. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And when you talk about full age, it doesn't mean um, you are older. It simply means the longer you've been in the word of God. There could be people that are in their 50s that are babes when it comes to the Bible. Because they never studied God's word. And it could be in your 20s or early 20s. And then be among, be those teaching those that are in their 50s. Because they don't know much, but you've been exposed, you've learned, and you, you had your milk for at least 10 years, and then you started to get strong meat, and you went deep into it, you can become a light to the world. But most Christians don't want to dig deep into God's word. They like the smooth words that makes them feel good, yet living in sin and thinking they are going to be saved while sinning. Instead of asking God to change them and be a light to the world. It's a deep subject. Now, East to West. I'm going to talk about that East to West because it's, I'm going to show you why it's a, that East to West thing is important. And Moses stretched out, stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind unto the land of all day that's that's the plagues that's in Exodus chapter 10 verse 13 and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided that's when they were crossing the Red Sea Exodus chapter 14 verse 21 by what way is the light parted which gathers the east wind upon the earth Job chapter 38, verse 24. For as the lightning comes, cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, verse 27. And the east and west thing. Let me quickly go um, back to that part. Because I think I should, I need to show you that one again. Um, look at it here again on the screen. You see the gate? Well, in the Bible, I believe it's in the book of Numbers, if I'm not mistaken, or Exodus. I have to go back and look at that again. The gate, there's only one gate. And the gate is on the east side. And so when you enter the sanctuary, you enter 
from the east and so you go in west there is a message called east to west in the bible uh and that message is actually everywhere in the bible and i just give you i just i just give you some uh I just gave you some uh, a few verses about it. There's more than that, but there is that message called East to West. And so what God is saying is, when you, I want you to go west to find me, and let's see. Remember that book I just quoted earlier called The Great Controversy. Let me actually go back over here again. In that book right here, Great Controversy, it, the book actually is called Great Controversy between Christ and Satan. In that book, I want you to look at something interesting. And if you see what I if you if you're gonna see what I'm trying to show you. Let's see. If you can actually find it. Uh, let me put that right here real quick. And then we're going to go to, so, so we're looking at the east to west, right? Now let's see if you can see it right here. The book starts like this, chapter 1, destruction of Jerusalem, chapter 2, persecution in the first century. And if you think about it, the, the 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 destruction of Jerusalem and the persecution in the first centuries happened in the Middle East area, or at least in Jerusalem. And then we will go to an era of spiritual darkness. Then we get the Warden Seas. Then we get John Wycliffe, which is England. Then we get Hassan Jerome. Then we get Luther's separation from Rome, chapter 7. Then we get Luther before the Diet, chapter 8. The Swiss Reformer, Progress of Reform in Germany, Protest of the Princes, the French Reformation, the Netherlands and Scandinavia, later English Reformers, the Bible and the French Revolution. And then we get the Pilgrim Fathers. Interesting, if you look at it, you're going to see the book starts on the east of the, of the, of the of planet Earth, east side. Jerusalem is east from England or from Europe because England, because the era of spiritual darkness, the warden seas, all of that has to do with Europe. Okay? And then in chapter 16, we come now to the United, the United, States, of Amer the United States of America. And so even the book itself is written starting from the east of planet earth and going to the west or to the eastern hemisphere to go to the western hemisphere and even that book that's why that's why i keep i, I tell people this book you have to read it will show you the history of the churches or the history of the of the church and then what is going on now and how you can be ready for the future and so here again the east to west message now let's go to present application of the candlestick you know you cannot be uh you cannot be a light to the world if you conform to the world okay and god calls us to become light to the world and so here what happens in netherlands in netherlands in the year 2000 they legalized same-sex marriage why is that important? Well, if you used to preach against same-sex marriage, before that, you were considered a virtuous preacher. But if you if you preach against that now, you become you be considered a bigot or a I don't know how they call it the misogynist. But you have to be willing to be a light to the world. You have to be willing to have that covenant to be a holy person, holy nation. And so, do we still, if, if we look at the bottom part of it, if we look at, if we actually, let me just read uh, real quick. In December 2000, the Netherlands became the first country to legalize same-sex mar mar marriage when the Dutch parliament passed by a 3-to-1 margin 
a landmark built around the practice. The legislation gives same-sex couples the right to marry, divorce, and adopt children. The legislation altered a single sentence in the existing civil marriage statute, which now reads, a marriage can be, can be contracted by two people of different or the same sex. That's it. The only opposition in Parliament came from the Christian Democratic Party, which at the time was not part of the governing coalition. After the law went into effect, the Protestant Church in Ireland, which then represented about 12% of the country's population, announced that individual congregations could decide whether to conduct same-sex marriage ceremonies. Although Muslim and conservative Christian groups continued to oppose the law, the same-sex marriage is widely accepted by the Dutch public. So, can you be a candlestick in that country? You have many opportunities to be a light to them, to open God's word, to show them that no, this is not what God wants for us to do because it is not healthy for us. And, I, and it's okay if they actually say I'm, I'm a bigot for not accepting it. That's fine. But uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be either they are right or I am right. And we'll see what it's, what, what it's going to boil down to. Now, here's the thing about the East to West message. Here it starts in Netherlands. Next, it goes to Belgium. Right? And you start with Netherlands. And then next it goes to Belgium. Which is still in the Europe area. Uh, at least I, I would put it that way. I would put it as the... It's in the Eastern Hemisphere. Right? Eastern Hemisphere. And then... What does it go next? Canada. East to West. Actually, anything that you can think of moves east to west. Where did boats come from? On the eastern hemisphere and then went to the western hemisphere. Where did civilization come from? On the eastern hemisphere to go to the western hemisphere. Where did where did we get slavery from? From the eastern hemisphere to the western hemisphere. They were sold from Africa, from Asia to the western hemisphere. Where do guns come from? They come from Eastern Hemisphere to Western Hemisphere because we know in 1492 when Christopher Columbus left um, Spain, even though he's from Netherlands, he's uh, from Holland, he left Spain, he came to the, to the Western Hemisphere and to colonize some of the countries. And they had guns, you know, boats. La Quinta, La Santa Maria, and La Pinta. They were boats that actually Christopher Columbus used to come to this world. And so where does, where does same-sex marriage come from? Same thing. So there is a message called East to West in the Bible that, that shows us everything moves East to West. Nothing moves West to East. And if something moves West to East, it's going the wrong way. It's going the wrong way. <clears throat> and so now we have in Canada same sex marriages. So don't be surprised. The message is still prevalent today. Now, how about some more news? How about how about um how about come on how about um being a light to the world. BBC News. Russia. Jehovah's Witnesses banned after the loose appeal. What happened here? <laughs> well. They were trying to do what? They were trying to preach. According to what they believe. Now I'm not, I'm, I don't condone their belief. Because their belief is erroneous. I don't condone that. But they actually live according to what they know. And that's the most biblical principle. You need to live according to what you know. Okay? And so here, even though their teaching is erroneous, yet they truly believe what they believe is true. And here, they could not actually um, be a light 
or even they will be false light. And I hope that many of them go back to their Bible and study again and see what God wants them to do. But still, they live according to what they know. And most Christians today do not do that. But of course, since the U.S. Um, condemns Russia's decision to ban them, then the ban was lifted. And so and that's a good news for them that they can still actually go out and do missionary work. And of course, uh, even Seventh-day Adventists, uh, just as me, we also uh, have that opportunity to be a light to the world and by putting God's word first. Now, here is uh, something I would like for you to, to learn today. And I put it that way. I put it as, are you will? When are you willing to ask God to make you a light to this world? You know. So we talked about being a light to the world, but the question is, when are you willing to ask God to make you a light to the world, or do you want to be a light to the world? Should I say? If you do, then in this book again, Great Controversy, page two hundred four, paragraph two. The experience of these noble reformers contains a lesson for all succeeding ages. Satan's manner of working against God and his word has not changed. He is still as much opposed to the scriptures being made to guide being made the guide of life as in the sixteenth century. In our time, there is a wide departure from their doctrines and precepts and there is need of a return to the great Protestant Bible and principle, the Bible and the Bible only, as the rule of faith and duty. Satan is still working through every means which he can control to destroy religious liberty. Hold on. The anti-Christian's power, which the Protestants of Spires rejected, is now with renewed vigor seeking to re-establish its lost supremacy. The same unswerving adherence to the word of God manifested at that crisis of the Reformation is the only hope of reform today. Now, let's go back to that yellow sentence. Satan is still working through every means which he can control to destroy religious liberty what does that mean for us today are you ready for what i'm gonna show you you know if if you are if you're living in the united in the u.s you should be happy to bring the message because there will be a time when the u.s will as well enforce the laws that will restrict your religious liberty as to preaching God's word. It actually already happened before that. It's not now. It's already happening in some places where if you preach certain things, you get fired from your job because you're not supposed to be preaching against what they believe. Now, what time are we living in? <laughs> Let's look at this. Crocs taking the Catholic post. Now it just uh it, it's actually it's not and um, that's not against Catholic Catholic Catholicism, it's just to show what's going on right now in the world. There was a research done, worldwide religious freedom restrictions on the rise. Interestingly, I wonder what it looks like now. Are you ready for this? You sure? April twelfth. 2007-17 Now look at this Look at this The level of government restrictions on religion in each country as of December 2015 Where is the US right now? Moderate I mean look at Russia Very high Russia we know for sure China. We know in many parts of the Middle East, it's definitely against Christians. Um, the only good place so far is in the Western Hemisphere, 
in um, in uh, in America, you know. In that in, in in the continent in the continent America, that's the easiest place to spread God's word. You know, we have Argentina, we have Paraguay, we have Brazil, we have Peru, you have Colombia, you have Venezuela, you have Uruguay, you have uh, um, Costa Rica, Panama, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, uh, Belize, Mexico, the, the U.S., the Canada, Greenland. We have Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, uh, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, St. Martin, Bahamas, uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we have the Papa, uh, the Gr the French Gr Grian and the Holland Grian. So we have like in most of the countries in the continent America. Yes, America is a continent, not a country. In most countries in the continent America, we have either low restriction, no data, moderate restriction. I think only in one little aspect. I think it's right, right above Brazil where it's actually high. And that's about it for right now. But in most countries in America, in the continent of America, it's low or moderate. Or maybe no data. It's very, very interesting. So we have it easy over here. Yet, we are lazy. And I think people are waiting for it to be very high. To start preaching God's word. And that will be too late for some of them. So. The question is. Do you want to be a light to the world? Do you want to be a light to the world? If you want to be a light to the world. You better start now. Because in the future. It's not going to get any better. And I'm trying to keep up with that. To know when it's actually updated to see what it is in uh but uh, they haven't updated it yet so i don't really know um, last time i checked it was the same picture it hasn't been changed yet and so but i want you to understand the candlestick the message of the century of the candlestick is we have to be a light to the world we have to be, have that covenant with god we have to be that holy people, that holy nation, that kingdom of priests. And so the question is, I'm going to be right now with you. Do you want to be a light to the world? Well, I hope that's your prayer. It is my prayer to be a light to the world. By however means that I can use. And I also pray that you also choose to be a light to the world. By whatever means is possible. Today was Sabbath, June 6th, 2020. And next, we will meet again on Sabbath, June 13th. And we're going to look at the third part of the sec of the of the holy place, which is the the altar of incense. And see what God has for us to learn. I will see you again uh, on Monday. Uh, I'm going to start a live video on Monday uh, from the book Fund Foundation Fu Fundamentals of Education. And we're going to do it on Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 6.30 to 7, um, God's willing. And so I hope to see you there. And if I, if I don't see you there, uh, and, or if I don't see tomorrow at all, then I hope to see you again when Jesus Christ comes the second time. To meet him in the air. May God bless you and have a happy Sabbath. Bye for now.